We are still continuing with our holiness sermon series, our degrees of separation series, and I have a little bit of a confession to start um, as a new-ish preacher, and that is that preaching about holiness is kind of hard. Um, I think teaching about holiness would be easier, because I could be like, well, you know, in the Greek, it says this, and um, in Jesus' time, this would have meant this, or um, rhetorically, the author here is, is doing this. But preaching is not teaching. Preaching is when we take a passage, and we prayerfully consider the passage, and then we prayerfully consider our congregation, and hopefully, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the time we get up here, we're ready to deliver a promise from God through the passage that is for this congregation. And when we're asked to preach a passage that's in the imperative, and by that I mean a command from God to do or be something, it can be hard to think of it as good news. And that is exactly what is the core, the heart of our passage today, a passage that is a direct quote from God. It is a command to be holy. And I don't know about you guys, but when I hear a command to be holy, it makes me wonder, how is a command good news? And one of the reasons I think it's hard to understand the command to be holy as good news is because we are a people living with one foot in two different realities, one where the call to holiness is good news, and one where the call to holiness becomes a source of anxiety. Because as Christians, we are living after the death and resurrection of Jesus, but before Jesus' final return. And that means we're living in a reality where we have already won the victory, but where that victory has not yet been fully realized. And I realize some of you might have a framework for understanding us as existing in the already, not yet. But I want to talk about that today with a little bit more depth. And what I really want to talk about is what our experience of the call to be holy sounds like in each one of those realities. So first, we are creatures. And created beings, creatures, are born into the world. I know, earth-shattering information we're starting with today. But the truth, the fundamental truth of creatures born into the world is that all creatures die. And because all creatures die and we live in this reality, this reality is under the reign of death, where our whole lives are oriented towards securing our own survival. That's why we'll do pretty much anything, lie, cheat, steal, sin, manipulate, oppress, or just passively engage in those things so that we can stay alive. And in this reality, God and other people and creation and even our own bodies become a means to an end to secure our own survival. And that's why when death reigns, sin is inevitable. But when we put our faith in Jesus, we are born again into a new reality, a reality that Jesus called the kingdom of God. And the fundamental truth of the kingdom of God for those of us who are saved by grace through faith is that we have eternal life. Because you see, where God reigns, life is guaranteed. And when we live in the reality of that life, we are free from trying to secure our own survival. We are free from the reign of death. We are free from the, we are no longer slaves to sin. Now we can live differently. We can treat God like God, not as a means to an end. And we can, and this is where holiness comes in, we can live pursuing shalom, the flourishing of all of creation and every person in it. So, what's the truth? What's the real reality? Well, the Christian hope is that the kingdom of God is the real, true reality. Jesus did defeat death. We are living an eternal life, and Jesus will come back again to make everything new and right and just and good. 
But in the meantime, we live with one foot in our creaturely reality. And we look all around us and we see the evidence of sin and death in the world and the creature in us gets scared and wants to secure its own survival. And so we slide back into a mode of living that matches our creaturely reality. That's why we still sin. That's why we still lie, cheat, steal, hate, oppress, manipulate, objectify. That's why we still seek flourishing from fame and fortune and our phones and our Facebook. And where this gets really wonky is when our spiritual lives get mixed with our creaturely fear. Where we believe that God is real, but we don't trust that God has given us eternal life. Because then we turn to religion to save ourselves. We think if we get just the right rules out of scripture, and if we act just the right way, and we associate with just the right people, we can save ourselves. In this reality, holiness doesn't really sound like good news. It sounds like a test that we could pass or fail, and that we might get it wrong, or worse, we might know what we're supposed to do, and we might not be able to do it. But holiness is not a test. Holiness is a new way of living that is only on the table because we have been born again. Holiness is making the choice to resist our creaturely reality, to, to resist living with the grain of our creaturely reality, to live against that, and to live with the grain of the kingdom of God. So, is it really a choice, though? Can we choose that? Well, we couldn't before. We couldn't before we were born again, but because God has acted, God has sent his son, and Jesus has died, and Jesus has been resurrected, and because the Holy Spirit has been poured out on us, we can now choose to live in this reality. We couldn't choose it without God, but now we can. And we can and must put effort and work in order to live in this reality. Now I know there's some Lutherans in the room, all the red flags went up, right, when I said effort and work, right? Are we allowed to say that Christianity is asking us to actually put in effort and do work? So to be clear, I'm not saying that you need to put in effort or do work to earn your salvation or to earn God's love. You don't need to do something to get into this reality, but the extent you wanna live like this reality is true it will take mental effort, it will take work, and we have a measure of control over how much we live in this reality. Let me try to tell you a story to explain what I mean. When, I think it's, I should, I should know his birthday, April, nope, not April, November 11th, nope, November 19th, 1981. So Joel turned 40 in the end of 2021. And when, for his 40th birthday, we got him a gift. And the gift was a CNC machine, um, which is like, if you don't know what it is, it's a giant wood carving machine where you can cut out wooden signs and specific shapes. You cook it up to a computer and it does that for you. And it was a big purchase for us, but it was his 40th birthday. It's something that he had wanted for a really, really long time. And we decided like, this is a good way to celebrate your 40th birthday. And since then, Joel has made a little business um, of selling these wood signs, and he has actually paid for that machine over and over and over again, which is very cool. But when I got him the machine, I didn't expect him to pay me back for it. It's not like I got it for him thinking like, okay, now you better pay for this. It was a gift. But also, when I got him the machine, I did expect him to use it. I expected him to create with it and to delight in it and to get the machine out of the box and use it for its intended purpose. If I had got him that gift and he had left it in the box, or if he had gotten it out of the box and let it sit in the garage and never used it, I would have wondered why he wanted the gift in the first place. Our salvation from God is a free gift. We don't have to earn it, and we don't have to make payments on it now that we have it. But God didn't give us the gift. He didn't defeat death 
He didn't defeat the power of sin so that we could continue to live in fear of death. Holiness is what happens when we take the free gift of salvation and we open it up and we use it for its intended purpose. So how do we do it? To answer that question, we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 25, and that's going to be on page 1203 of your pew Bible if you want to follow along. Now, I'm going to start out with just the first half of verse 13, because it is just too funny and too helpful not to think about for just a couple of seconds. Now, if you're reading in your Bible, what you're reading is it's going to say, therefore, preparing your minds for action. And this is like a valid English translation. It's fine. It works. But the Greek here says something very different. In the Greek, what it says is, gird the loins of your mind. That's how we're going to prepare. And if you don't know what girding your loins is, let me see it up there. Okay, so in the olden days, right, you would usually wear a robe, man or woman, you would have something that went all the way down to your feet. And so if you were going to work in the field or go to war, you were going to need to get that skirt out of the way in order to do your business. And trust me, as somebody who has worn a long skirt before, this is a real thing. So you'll notice that it's one thing when you pull your skirt up above your knees, now you have full mobility of your legs, but now you don't have your hands. So in order to be able to fight or do like heavy manual labor, they would pull up their skirt and then they would do a move with their skirt so that they basically turned into a pair of shorts and now they were really ready to get to business. So when we're saying gird the loins of your mind, we're saying get your mind ready to do some work. And I don't know if you guys remember, we did the whole focus sermon series last year and it was great, but we did miss a huge opportunity to call it the gird your loins sermon series. Because that would have been an unforgettable title, and it really, really gets to the heart of what we're talking about today. Um, Because think about it, if you are going to live in the reality that you are living in by faith, in a world where everything around you is telling you a different message, you are going to have to get your mind ready and focused on the kingdom reality. So what would that look like in practice? And once this passage gets going, we have what looks like to me kind of a two-step between focusing your mind on the kingdom reality so that you can live the kingdom reality as true. Just like when you walk, your leg muscles pushing forward, your left leg, and then your right leg, they're both doing different things, but they're always working together. The focus that you put on the kingdom reality propels your action, and then when God shows up in your action, it propels your trust in the kingdom reality, and it just keeps moving forward. So let's go now to the middle of verse 13 and see what this looks like. Being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Focus your mind on the promise of Jesus' final salvation so that you can leave behind your previous life. He goes on. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time in exile. Do you see the two-step here? Focus, trust that God will give you what you need so that you can live like God is the one to save. In other words, live in that kingdom reality. And finally, and bear with me because this one's got a little bit of meat to it. Knowing that you were ransomed from feudal ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, 
Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. The two-step, know that Jesus' death worked and that you really do have eternal life so that you can start treating God and the people in this world not as a means to an end, but with pure brotherly love. And here's Peter's kicker. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass, the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the good news that was preached to you. In this new reality, God isn't dead, and you aren't dead. In this new reality, God is not dying, and no matter what is going on in your body today, you are not dying. In this reality, God is living an eternal life And you also, by the power of the Holy Spirit, are already living in eternal life. Yes, the world is perishing all around you. The grass withers, the flowers fall, and you can still see violence, war, death, racism, objectification, manipulation, forms of slavery and suffering all over the world. But the good news is that you have been born into a new reality. You are already living in the kingdom of God. And the only question is, are you going to put forth the effort to live in the reality that you were made for? So now I know what you're thinking. I'm ready to gird my loins. I want to live in that reality. I want to start living my best kingdom life now and be holy. Where do I start? And here's where I have to ask for your forgiveness. Because there has been a lot of buildup to this point of like living in a whole new reality that you must be thinking, oh, she's going to give me new information that I've never heard before. But... The way we start our walk in holiness, the way we start living in this new kingdom reality is actually pretty simple. It's committing to life as a disciple. Going to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind, And like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted and tasted that the Lord is good. You were born again in a new reality and discipleship is how you learn to live in it. If you want to live like the promises of God are true, it's time to get to know God and God's promises like never before. But... I don't want to undersell discipleship because make no mistake, discipleship isn't just about knowing God, not that that's not incredibly important, but discipleship is a rebellion in and of itself because when we read and study scripture, we resist the world's claim to truth. When we worship, we resist the world's claim to glory. When we observe the Sabbath, We resist the world's lie that we have to strive for our own survival. When we give offering, we resist the world's lie that God will not provide for us. When we feed the poor, we resist the world's lie that we would be better off without them. When we come together as the body of Christ, we resist the world's lie that this is a life that's every man for himself. And when we are baptized, we resist the world's lie that death is in our inevitable end. And when we come forward to receive Holy Communion, we resist the world's lie that God abandoned us to do this life on our own. Discipleship isn't just the practice of coming to know God. Discipleship is the rebellion itself. So, as we enter this time of continued worship, 
and giving our offerings and praying together and receiving Holy Communion, let us know and name what we are really doing together. We are rebelling against the lie that we are perishing. We are living like the promises of God are real. We are being holy, not because we are better than everyone else, but because we live in a reality where we are free to pursue the flourishing of everybody else. Let's pray. God, we want to be holy like you are holy. Help us to live with our feet firmly planted in the reality of the kingdom of God, to know that we have eternal life, to live from and with that reality. Help us to focus our minds on the truth of what you are and what you have done and what we now are as well. Help us to love our neighbor, to treat you as our loving God and not a means to an end or an idol. Help us to see creation as a gift from you to pursue its flourishing. Help us to live like eternal life is real, like you are really going to make things new and that you have really saved our souls. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.